All right. So today I'll be presenting my honors project that I've done in collaboration with Noesis, and in particular their modeling social behavior for healthcare utilization and depression. So this team it works on a funded project through the National Institutes of Health um, <coughs> in collaboration with Cornell, and they are trying to find new ways to, de to identify depression and how we can possibly combat depression. So I started working on this project in spring of 2017, and today I'll be going over my work. So I'll start off with an introduction to the topic that I'm studying, move on to my research question, along with some of the related work, and then move on to my approach, and then follow up with some of the results, preliminary results that we've seen, and then conclude with questions. So what is major depressive disorder? So the Mayo Clinic defines depression as a mood disorder that causes a persistent feeling of stress um, and sadness and loss of interest. So depression can really affect the way you think, feel, and behave. And because it touches so many areas of your life, um, it can cause a wide range of emotional and physical problems. So the, the chart on, um, on the slide shows some of the uh, common symptoms of depression. And these d symptoms are identified as clini uh, by clinicians uh, to determine if a patient is possibly depressed or not. So these symptoms include um, lack of interest, lack of appetite, um, image, body image issues, um, lack of sleep, uh, lack of interest in daily activities, um, and eventually can even lead to suicide. So uh, as we can see, uh, depression has a, quite a few heavy symptoms that are associated <coughs> with it, and it has uh, a very high prominent to related to suicide rates. And the quote here shows uh, that how important it is for us to study depression. So this quote is talking about how the state of Iowa only has 4% of the uh, recommended psychi psychiatric beds that it needs in its facilities. So what this is saying is that there are not enough um, beds to serve patients that suffer depression in the state of Iowa. So using this and uh, the report by the World Mental Health Survey in 2017, which reported that approximately 17 million Americans suffer from depression, we can see why it is so important to study and look at depression today. So uh, just as an aside, interestingly, um, yesterday I saw uh, the ranking of 50 states mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, uh, for health care. How well they are. And the two issues they that were talked about were percentage or three issues only talked about the percentage of the people caught by uh, insurance, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the overdose death, and mental health uh, excess. These are the only three issues that were highlighted in ranking of all the states. That shows the importance of this topic. Correct. So, so it, it's really a very it's a global issue, and it, it it's definitely impacts U.S. citizens, and eventually we would like to save a lot of lives by helping uh, those who have don't have access to these uh, facilities or are lacking treatment. So currently, the way um, that organizations like SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, uh, monitor depression in the general population using surveys and uh, phone questionnaires. So these surveys um, are typically sent out after a patient has visited a mental health service provider. Um, and these surveys have some inherent flaws that are associated with it. And some of these flaws include cognitive bias. So this is the way the questions are formatted and um, how long the questions are. So oftentimes the question might not be asking enough um, information or maybe subjective <coughs> to those who are taking the questionnaire. Additionally, there is a underrepresentation and sampling bias associated with questionnaires. So these questionnaires um, are only sent to those patients that have recently visited a mental health service. So it's missing out on the general population that doesn't necessarily go see a uh, mental health service provider or doesn't go to the doctor frequently for their needs. Um, additionally, incomplete information. So these questions that are typically on these questionnaires are for within what's happened within the last month or the last two weeks. So it doesn't really include kind of your life story, which oftentimes um, is important for those patients that are suffering with depression. And furthermore, we've noticed that there's a, a big temporal gap between when these surveys are taken and when the data is actually used. So these surveys um, have a lag between the data processing, data collection, to data utilization. And this gap uh, is 
it's, it's kind of big when you think about it, because if I take my data today, process it today, and if I'm not using the data until three years from now, it's kind of outdated. So this is um, another reason that uh, we need to study, we need to look at different alternatives to study um, depression in the general population. So this leads me to my research question for today, and it's can we identify potential depressed users using social media to supplement existing methods of determining the adequacy of mental health facilities in the U.S. So this is a handful, but I'll narrow it down on the next slide. All right, so really the research question can be broken down into two areas. So the first area <coughs> is identifying users that are depressed. So this consists of de developing a framework to automatically identify depressed users, um, and we're particularly focusing on social media and Twitter. Uh, so um, I'll talk about why social media and why Twitter, particularly in, in, on later slides. And then the second portion of the research question is determining the location of depressed users. So there are really two main research areas uh, for this project, and when we combine those, we can help uh, see where the current mental health facilities are and see where our depressed users are and how well uh, we can mismatch the two or, how, or what differences can be seen from our data versus data that's already out there. So why study social media? Recently there's been a big hype in studying social media for various reasons. Uh, one, from making business decisions to getting customer feedback on recent product launch um, and to even study some he men, um, health concerns. And in particular, social media um, has also been used for predicting election results. So Nui says last year for the election did quite well in predicting the election results. So as you can see, this has a social media has a wide range of applications. Actually, did you see that we predicted yesterday's call? Right? Oh, Sorry? No, I, I haven't. I uh, we had a here. post out in December 7th oh, okay. about uh, 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 John Sweeney. Mm -hmm. And yesterday, my first post was at noon, okay. saying John Sweeney. For the Alabama, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, see, it's everywhere. Social media um, is used for a variety of purposes, <coughs> and is, is actually quite helpful um, in quite some, in a lot of scenarios. So, moving on to why study social media on Twitter in particular. So, as you can see, there are sample depressed or potential depressed users on the screen here, and these profiles are. Um, indicative of some of the depression symptoms. So the first profile is the spat. So you can see someone is, um, has concerns with their body image. Um, then second, we have suicidal thoughts, including laser blades, um, and then also anxiety that's associated with depression. So this right here shows that users are using Twitter to share their daily experiences, their ups and downs, um, and are quite ex expressive. So really what we want to try to do is we want to try to capture these users and see if they have um, enough facilities located near them uh, to help them get through, the, through this phase in life. All right, so previous work for studying depression on social media really consists of um, doing depression on a post-by-post -post basis or on a user level. So the features, some of the features that they include is language style, so using LIWC, which is a uh, tool used by psychologists, to uh, measure various um, characteristics of a person's text content. Additionally, there's sentiment analysis that they conduct on tweets, so determining how positive or how negative a tweet is uh, based on its content. Additionally, they do ego network, which is determining who, what user is following whom and who is following them back. So this is trying to measure the network of depressed users and uh, see if, there's, if they follow like-minded people or similar users that are suffering through the same things that they are. Additionally, we also have user, user engagement. So how often are they tweeting? How often are they favoring another person's tweet? How often um, are they following new users? Or how often is their content being um, used or, or liked or tweeted by other users? So this brings me to my approach. And it's, it's some of the initial steps are quite similar to previous works. And then we'll move on to how, how we're doing this. <coughs> so the first thing is uh, the depression team here has a uh, list of 200 million users that are potentially depressed. And they use this, they mined this list through their previous project, which uh, developed a lexicon of depressive terms that they went and you searched Twitter for. So these are depressive terms either in their profile description um, or in their screen name. So uh, they use this to get a very big data set of 200 users 
for um, us to use, and I focused on collecting both a user's tweet profile content and a couple of uh, other things that I'll mention on the next slide. So this was a pretty interesting problem for me because it had a lot of computational um, costs associated with it. I used a distributed um, cloud computing system to collect all of my data with Elasticsearch, which is a dynamic database uh, that I can store my data in and it can change the schema as um, new items are added into a field. Additionally, um, I also use Kibana, which is like a plugin for Elasticsearch, and uh, it really helps you visualize um, your data really readily and quickly available. Um, and once I collect those users, I go on to feature engineering. And what feature engineering consists of is determining um, the average number of tweets, uh, retweets that a tweet has. So this type of stuff is not available aggregated for me to use, so I have to go and calculate these metrics myself. So Twitter will give me each post and how many times it's favorited or how many times it's liked, but when I want to get the average or the most or the mean or the min, I have to do some of the uh, metrics on my end. So once I have all of my features, I go into a, a classifier stage, which consists of determining if a user is depressed or not based on the features that I've identified. And this was some machine learning um, application used in this approach, and it was a pretty interesting uh, classifier to build because this was the first time I worked on textual data and numeric features in the same data set. Um, and then once we have depressed users, we move on to the location inferencing phase, and I'll move on to this portion in a, in a different, different slide. So here's my approach for the data <coughs> collection and just kind of broad um, getting to a step where I can extract their user location. So the first thing is when I collect the user's data, I'm looking for um, their tweets, their profile, uh, their followers and their friends. So I use their followers and friends as unseen data to test on. Um, so this is different from previous approaches because previously they modeled the network using friends and followers, um, but I'm saving the friends um, and followers and um, who they're following for the testing data set. Um, additionally, so feature engineering, I talked about I talked about training a classifier, I talked about testing a classifier, and then I also talked about validating my results. So I'll mention um, a few of these again um, in my later slide. And then um, the location is extraction. So here's just like a brief overview of the three techniques that I use, and I'll go into a more in-depth analysis of what each of these are. Yes? I just want to make sure on the same page. So your original, for the purposes of your classification, mm -hmm. all the people who had been, all the accounts that had previously been classified as mm -hmm. being depressive by one measure, yes, is considered your, one, is, is considered your class, yeah, mm -hmm. and rather than holding some of that back, mm -hmm. you've created a completely different class of mm -hmm. people who follow those people as your test case for, also assuming therefore that they're all suffering from MDD as well. Uh, we're not making that assumption right now. So what I'm taking is that if, if I have a depressed user, if I, rather than including their network in the classification process, I save this for later, so then I can see if they're depressed or not. So right now, if I know that this profile is depressed, I don't know how many of their followers are depressed or not, because okay. we don't have that data available to us. So, so you're not making an assumption, you're just using it to define who the, who, what an interesting mm -hmm. test set might be. Yeah. Okay, yes. that's yeah. fair. Right on. Thank you. Um, and training the classifier involves human annotations, and I'll talk about this in, uh, in a future slide. So this is basically having uh, human judges look at a person's Twitter profile and determine if they're depressed or not. And the, the <coughs> metric that they use is, use is PHQ-9, which is a questionnaire used by clinicians to determine the severity of depression. So we hand our human judge judges the PHQ-9 questionnaire, and they will go and analyze each profile uh, to determine which depression symptoms they show, if any. Hey, what does PGO do? Uh, PGO is a third-party tool that will determine a user's location uh, based on their tweet content, and I'll talk about this more in a, in a little bit. <coughs> okay, so here are some of the features that I used in my um, depression classifier. So currently uh, what I did was I included <coughs> the tweet content uh, and I combined the tweet text and then I did sentiment analysis over the combined tweet text. So this gives you overall this is the polarity of a user and then the second thing I did was I took each tweet and found the 
or found the retweet count and the favorite account and then averaged this. So on average, a user will get three to four, uh, three retweets on their tweet or will get four favorites. So this average count is just kind of overall what did they, what did they get? And then um, I also did average sentiment uh, analysis over each individual tweet. Furthermore, we look at how many people they're following, how many people are following them, which is their friends, how many likes, so how many times have they liked um, public posts, and how many times have they tweeted in their uh, Twitter history span. So this is interesting because I can only get so many tweets from the Twitter API, which is 3,000, is typically where it caps around. But if I can know that this person has been um, super active based on how many tweets they have, it can be another uh, possible indication for us to look into. Um, additionally, I also consider the description on a user's profile. So, so as you can see, this, uh, sim this um, description here says depression, self-harm, and anxiety. So these are symptoms of depression and can be indicated if a profile is depressed or not. And then I think to me the most interesting feature is using their screen name and the lexicon that was developed by the depression team. So I talked about this lexicon previously, um, and it was used to collect individuals based on their description. But now what I'm doing is I'm using the lexicon and the screen uh, name to determine the Levenstein distance between, the minimum Levenstein distance between a screen name and a word in the lexicon. And to me, this is a very unique feature uh, because it, it's an edit by edit character difference of the screen name and the words that are in our lexicon. So for example, this user, uh, her screen name might be depressed gal. So this fits very well in our lexicon and I will show an example of this later. So what I do is I take a user's screen name and find the minimum distance between any word in our lexicon and use that as a feature in my classifier as well. And because you have a fixed number of tweets, mm -hmm. are we taking on in what time interval were those tweets sent as one of the features? Uh, Right now, we're not doing any time series work yet. We're just taking the recent tweets and then processing them. But the way that the data is stored, it is very easy for us to expand our work um, to incorporate time series. So, and that, that's something the depression team as a whole is looking at, and we'll be working on this more next semester, is using a profile and seeing how the profile has changed from the beginning of their account to, uh, or sorry, to when we can first get their tweet to their recent tweet. And here, here's like a sample, sample difference between a depressed user and a non-depressed user. So again, here's the Levenstein distance I was talking about. So depressed, blank, and for various reasons, I can't show the actual screen name, so I have to block it out. But let's just say this, this person's profile was depressed gal or depressed, uh, or depressed tomorrow or today or something like that. So their Levenstein distance is very low because it matches with the terms in our lexicon. Um, and then Jane Doe, who's just a regular name, regular person, her at a distance is not similar, so it has a higher difference, uh, zero versus six. So her name's not similar to our lexicon, so she would be treated as an average user, if depending on how, how much importance we give to the Levenstein distance. Additionally, tweet count. So a depressed user hasn't tweeted a lot, uh, but Jane Doe here has tweeted quite a bit. And then we have the difference in their text, um, the different in their followers count. And you'll notice their friend count is not too different. So these are the people that they're following. So typically, uh, we notice that if um, people on Twitter will follow a lot of people, but not a lot of people will follow them back. And this is partly because they're following celebrities or uh, famous uh, politicians and stuff like that. So it's hard, it's hard to use the following count as a feature, but we're including it. Um, to see if it will make a difference. And we'll, we'll do further evaluation on each of these features um, as a team. But for my project, I'm just gonna make the assumption that I think that this is gonna work, so we're gonna So my Twitter handle has SAD, so am I gonna be tagged as depressed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, edit distance, so yes. Uh, so based on the Levenstein distance on the algorithm, it would capture this ad and yeah, you might have uh, closer oh. Levenstein distance to the lexicon. <laughs> <laughs> but that's only one feature, right? Yeah, that's only one feature. And I don't tweet much, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you have cross I mean, ads, you have few followers. <laughs> <laughs> you, have you, you might be one of our yeah, um, annotations. No, no. It's, it's <laughs> uh, but really, what we want to do is expand our feature set. So, what the depression team what we're trying to do as a whole is look at image features, 
the time of day you're tweeting. So some of these more complicated features that take quite a while to engineer and to process and feed into our classifier. So for example, we're working, on, we're working on images right now. It's not included in this work, but it takes a lot of time to download an image, process it, to get all of the uh, features that we want out of an image, and then use it in our classifier. So um, that's a lot of the future work that we're going to do. Uh, but for this project and for my independent study, I primarily focused on these features. <coughs> so let's move on to some training and testing data. So I said that I used a big cloud computing system, and you're probably wondering, so how many users did you actually end up getting? So they had over 200 million users, um, but uh, I didn't use all 200 million of them to collect the data. So what we had is we had a subset of annotated users that we got based on human judges. So my first step is to get their tweet content um, and get their followers and followees. So like, I, like we talked about, the making a unique test set. So rather than including the followers and followees in, into the test set, we're, we're saving them for the testing data, or sorry, the training data, we're saving them for the testing data. And this is, and to me this is, we're, we're more using the network in a holistic approach rather than using it in our classifier. Um, and then, so if you look at the numbers, they were uh, out of the 40,000 self-reported users that we had, uh, so it's a subset of the two million, I was, uh, we had annotated users so I calculated all the annotated users, moved on to the rest of the uh, self-reported users, got each one of their followers and followees. So it's about uh, 16 or 15,000 followers right now, and all of their tweet content has been gathered, and about 7,000 friends right now, which is who they're following. And um, so this is very interesting because the data collection is an ongoing process, and Every day there's more data that's added, so these numbers are probably outdated by the time I'm presenting now. So, yeah. So I'll, I'll be the guy who keeps erupting because I think this is, I might be unique, this is the first time I've seen this, right? Mm -hmm. um, I just make sure I'm understanding exactly what you're doing here. Yeah. So in your training data, the number of depressed users is indicated by the Livingston distance, right? That's how you determined, am I wrong there? Oh, a human judge, human a human A human mm -hmm. judge? Yes, for my training data. Yeah. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Good. Okay, so yeah, yeah, those, those uh, training data are manually verified by um, two to three annotators uh, to determine how well the annotation quality is and how and if we should use the annotation for it. And, and their categories are depressed, not depressed, or I don't know? Yeah, or I don't know, yeah. And then other users is the indeterminate. Yep, yep. indeterminate. Okay. Yeah, so this, this is only about the classifier, and the previous one was about features that the classifier used. Right, yeah. but I, I, I thought test. I heard that your original classification of the people before you come up with their value presence was, was, was a done with a textual analysis. Uh, oh, no, no, I was no, concerned yeah. you were using the same feature mm -hmm. as you used to create your, yeah. your training data. No, no, no. Yeah, clearly, yeah, yeah. clearly you're good. Carry on. <laughs> okay, yeah. I love it. Yeah, maybe I can add something here. So the idea is first, uh, I think we need to have some discussion about what is self-reported users. So the self-reported users become a big set of users that they are having a specific terms that we already create and put it as a lexicon of depressive <coughs> indicative terms. So these users self-reported, they have these kind of terms in their description. So first we start up with these kind of users and then we, uh, we ask our human judge to see whether they are really having PSQ9 symptoms or not. Then we, we only decide that, okay, this is our gold standard they are suffering from depression as a, U, as a yes, basically as a yes class. So are the same terms that are used to put them into the state where the human judge looks at them, the terms that are used by the Lemmings and distance? Yes. So you do have a situation then, perhaps, where your training data is biased towards a particular feature? No. So here, yeah. Because no. the Levenstein distance is used for their description, not their screen name. Just so the screen names. Just, All right, yeah, great. Yeah, Again, just, I need to get caught up to, to speed okay. on this. This, this is great. I love it. There's a lot of different <laughs> yeah, features. So, yeah, yeah. so I'll just, yeah. just for variation, I'll add a question yeah. too. Um, so the 200 million, mm -hmm. those are self-reported depressed people? No, who, the two, who, the, who are they? Yes. So here is the thing. The 200 million users, we have their screen name and their description. So the first filter is who are the users who who, are, who, is, who has depressive indicative terms in their description. 
Okay. Then we get set but that's, of users. That's yeah. within the 200 million. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so it's like we don't have 200 million depressed no, people. No, no, no. Okay, because <laughs> yeah. that would that yeah, was sort of question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, what, what depression means. Yeah. Yeah. That's the data set that yeah. uh, okay. was uh, good, qualified enough for yeah. doing this study. And, yeah. then, okay. and then the question is, some of the users who has depressive indicative terms in their description, they are not suffering from depression. Yeah. Because what we observe is some of them are writers and writing about the psychologists, psychology and psychiatrists and stuff, so they are, they, they are writers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or they are movie Doctors. directors. Yeah. We have life coaches on there too. Yeah. So. That's why or the description is really yes. for initiating the process. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, so 200 million users is our big data set. We narrow them down to uh, 40,000 self-reported, but I'm only able to collect so many users. Okay. Um, and then from the self-reported, we annotate a subset of them. So it's really like big 200 million, narrow it down to self-reported, then we narrow it down to our annotated data. You're keeping on increasing this, right? Yes, definitely. So wow. the data collection is ongoing, and these numbers, like I said, are probably outdated by the time I'm talking about them right now. Um, and so moving on to this column, this is our testing data set. And these are the results from our classifier. So I'll go on to like the classifier accuracy in a little bit. But if you look, I because I did collect all of these users, but it takes a very long time to process each one of them and get them through the classifier. So I focused on a small subset. And from those subset, I identified um, almost 2,000 depressed users and approximately 4,500 non-depressed users. And we have some other users um, so, for example, if the description or the tweet content was zero, <coughs> they're classified as others because uh, I, I'm not able to use their features. Not enough information. Mm -hmm. Not in, in, enough information for this data set. And as I mentioned, the testing data is consider, consisted of those self-reported users that are not annotated, the followers that I've collected, and the friends. So I've taken a subset of each of these and just combined them to test on. So here are the results of the classifier. So the first classifier I built was all numeric features. So not really incorporating any description or anything, just going on some of the really obvious features that you see in a profile. And then I kind of fine-grained that to include a lot of different features. So the first we talk about how many people they're following, how, how many, what's their listing count, so how many likes have they um, ever liked, how many tweets have they ever liked, or how many tweets have they retweeted. So this comes down as a listed and then the number of friends and the Levenstein distance. So the second class that I built, I used their user description. Um, so basically, I, may I say very simplistically that if I primarily go with IR kind of study, mm -hmm. then that's your first uh, row? Uh, no, IR is the third one. Right, no, so no, information retrieval with text. from things that uh, doesn't uh, include much other than keywords and uh, yeah, okay. very that's basic metro feature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, if, uh, sorry, I, I was thinking IR and text features, sorry. But yes, yeah, that would be correct. And then the third row actually increases their or uses their tweets. So what's really interesting is that when you look at the two classifiers I picked, so I picked naive base and uh, sector, or na multinomial naive base and support vector machines. So both of these are very well-known classifiers in the text classification field um, and are used quite often. So when you look at the performance of just the numeric features, they pretty much perform the same. And then when you look at incorporating the user description, the the multi uh, the night the support vector machines does a little poorly than the multinomial. Um, and this is just because of the way the support vector machine algorithm works. Um, and then when you add your text classification or your tweet content, the accuracy is comparable again. And this is very interesting because typically a lot of people, when they look at text data, they expect SVM to work the best. Um, and then multinomial to work uh, significantly lower than SVM. But when I combine the non-numeric features, I see that they're pretty comparable. And uh, so this is very interesting to me because typically when I worked on my gender race violence project previously, SVM did way better than multinomial. And that time we only had textual features, but this time when I incorporate numeric features, my multinomial performs just almost as well as my support vector machines. And uh, another thing that I noticed, and a lot of people, uh, a lot of my mentors here and I had a discussion, is that when you really include features like text that are really heavy, they kind of overshadow your numeric features. So the textual data carries a lot of weight in the classification process 
when compared to the new Did you features. have a scope of providing any weights on the features? So I myself have not done that yet, but for uh, the depression team, our paper is going to be focused on determining um, which features are the best, including um, chi-squared test, significance test, and a lot of the other analysis that we, we would want to do to actually publish the paper uh, will be done as a part of the team's effort. Yeah, yeah. but won't, won't, won't the classifier implicitly learn it? Um, I mean, that's what it will figure out, right? That which features are more important to get it right? Correct, but we have a lot of other features that aren't included in the data set as well. So, I mean, for this data set, it probably picked the text features as yeah, whatever uh, allowed it to classify it yeah. meaningfully. Mm -hmm. Would but it be, I, I, I think you make a good point, TK, but would it be that um, a human judgment uh, should be pitted against machine judgment and see what we get? Yeah, I mean, we can certainly... I think uh, you know, intuitively type something and right. see what happens. That would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, does it mean that we are uh, going to get at least 85%? I, I think yeah. so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, definitely. And I, and I think... The team has a pretty big vision of using deep learning and word embeddings, so models that significantly outperform um, typical IR models. So uh, I'm really excited to see our So results. I think with the embedding, you'll be able to get a lot of uh, 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 fine-grained usage of the text uh, from mm -hmm. this, and then, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, again, I'm just making sure I got my, I'm not making any assumptions. Yeah. So for your test data now, mm -hmm friends of mm -hmm. your original uh, training data. Yeah. Did you again use human judgment on all, whatever, 15,000 of those? Mm -mm. How do you determine truth that for your purposes of determining accuracy? How do you determine the truth state of these so, friends and others? Um, I did cross-validation on my gold uh, standard data. So it's just trend gold cross-validation where it takes a bunch of training data, splits it up into uh, train and test data sets. And then it varies which data set or which portion of the data it's going to test and train on. So I think the answer that you're looking for is, did you have a human analyze these results yet? Right to see. Yeah, I mean, yeah. If, you're, if you're talking about accuracy mm -hmm. and you don't know the truth state, then yeah. yeah. So that that's another part that we'll be doing <laughs> in a little bit future work right now because this is just numeric calculations that is done using cross validations, but I still need to have a human look at them and see which profiles. Yeah, but you there. told me that training data was annotated. Yeah, the training data, which I use for classifications, but Dr. Dean was talking about the testing data, right? Verifying the testing data, yeah, the yeah. results of the testing. Yeah, test but cross validation data. was doing, intrinsically it has uh, human labels, right? Yeah, so but I think he wants to see the actual profiles that were incorrectly classified, right? Is that what you're trying to get at? So I mean, so I'm assuming that re you would like to see more than these th these numbers, right? You yeah, it's it yeah. it's easy to head down a rabbit hole mm -hmm. when you yeah. have yeah, 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 yeah. good. Yeah. So maybe I can add another point here. So the data set that the figures actually that Kumit present fourteen thousand data is our gold standard data, mm -hmm. and she is using tenfold cross validation and basically leave one out. So. Uh, each time, each time the average of the classifier it is calculated based on this. Then she is gonna build the model and fit it into complete unseen data. And this is the the, the other data set that she was talking about, the followers and followers. Mm -hmm. And then we are then we are gonna randomly sample hundred of them and see how actually our classifier works in the real scenario and in prediction framework. Correct. So the sampling will help us determine how well our classifier performed on certain profiles. So this again requires uh, human annotations, and the problem with human annotations is that oh, yeah. it's expensive, yeah, exactly. and getting students to annotate them is, takes quite a bit of motivation. So uh, for the simplicity I'm reporting, and, and, and money, yeah, <laughs> uh, is cross-validation results. So just, just a quick recap to kind of cover the picture. What we did was we took our uh, training data, performed classification, and then did cross-validation. So it splits up the training data into different sets and uh, assumes that this set I have never seen before, so let me train on the portion above it, and then let me test on it. So this way the machine knows what the right answers are by covering some areas of the data set. And, but we don't have human annotations to verify the classification results yet. Future work. So I pretty significantly talked about the profile classification part. Now I'm going to move on to my location inferencing part. 
um, of the presentation. So the way the location inferencing portion of the presentation works and the project works is that I take my depressed users, so results from my classifier and my training data, and I process those users in kind of like a filter. So the first filter is do these um, Twitter users have a geo coordinate either in their tweet profile or their Twitter, uh, or sorry, their tweet um, content that I get from Twitter or their Twitter profile. So if my geo services are enabled and I tweet somewhere, Twitter is, can capture where, where I'm tweeting from. And for simplicity reasons, uh, we go with the first um, geo coordinate tweet that we find because it will be the most <coughs> recent location of the user. Second, we do place mentions. So um, a lot of Twitter users sometimes have, well, I guess I can't say a lot, but frequently Twitter users have um, place mentions in their profile. So I can say Dayton, Ohio, Wright State University. Um, so I'm mentioning a place in my profile. In this particular topic, they are they probably will be fewer than the average. Correct, yeah. Um, so that also plays a role in this data set. And then additionally, when I tweet, I can tweet about being um, at the Wright State Library. So these are place mentions and Twitter is able to capture them and geo, uh, geotag them for us. So these first two filters are based on geo coordinates that I can get from Twitter uh, based on the um, content of the tweet or the profile. Then the third is our PGO tool. So this tool, uh, what this tool does, it, ta it takes the tweet content and then looks for all of the users that are mentioned in the tweet and then compares it to a world data set they have that has a bunch of Twitter users and their locations. So this group has been working on geolocations for quite a bit of time. So they have a really big data set of Twitter users and where they're located. Um, so it does a, again, an ego network analysis to determine where a user is located. So if I'm frequently talking to users in the Dayton region and they don't have my location, um, it, it's safe to say that with uh, they report about 70% accuracy that I'm probably in the Dayton region. So why did you draw a funnel like that? Um, so I, th I thought the number of tweets with tags will keep increasing as you go from one to two to three. Yes, correct. The funnel is kind of like a filter. So you sift out some users, and then in the end you come I think it's increasing. Yeah, it's, I, okay, so I guess the funnel should be inverse. For me, I was looking at it as like a sifter. I sift out these users and keep them, and then more fine green. Um, so those are like the obvious results, and then PGO. The good thing about this approach is that I can use any third-party tool that can give me a user's location and plug it right in. So we have a lot of geolocation work going on at Noesis. So Hussein is working on a lot of um, his exciting work with Hazard C. So later what I can do is I can pull PGO and plug his tool in, and the approach would, would, would not change. The, sure, the accuracy and the results might change, um, but uh, this method is very uh, open to any tool that can give me. You said you should replace this, or compare this with your stuff, and then prove that your stuff is better result for yeah. depression. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll notice that a lot of our users actually don't have their geo coordinates enabled or don't have place mentions, but rather a lot of them have to go to this thirty third party tool. So a lot of the results that you're going to see for the next portion are a lot of preliminary results that we're using uh, based on this method. And like I said, the better tool we get to tag the geolocation, the better our results will be. So we kind of take this tool and, and they report a 70, around a 70% accuracy. So we're gonna go with that assumption um, and say for now this is the state of the art approach for determining their location. So, so what are, what's the basis for their tool? You know? Oh, yeah, so as I mentioned, the tweet content, figuring out users. So they, they use tweet content to estimate the geo? Yeah, right. the geolocation. I mean, uh, you remember Rethi's work, right? Yeah, yeah. So this work, yeah, that's what I want uh, Where there we got 50% uh, of the people within 100 mile radius right. uh, kind of thing, right? Ah, right. So, uh, okay. uh, and I think the there we are, we are solely relying on identifying location names in the tweets and using the Wikipedia as a basis of um, right. trying to find whether there is a you know location, the that, you know metro kind of city. Yeah. Okay. Here they have uh, they are basing on uh, this very large <coughs> data set of uh, individuals no. for whom they what believe they have the location the yeah. and they are building on the top of it. Mm. But I'm guessing that in this case they have done a lot more manual work, mm. yeah. lot more manual work. I mean all these people that they have put, they probably are trying to. 
you know, at least initial seed site of millions are probably uh, manually uh, added, and then you can build the eco network on the top of it. Yeah, and um, part of the reason the way the approach is laid out for the location inferencing is because of the way the tool works. So the tool is really only using the text in the tweet. It's not using the geo coordinates provided by Twitter. Mm -hmm. So I kind of wanted to take more of the burden off the, the third party tool and look for users that actually have a geolocation because why send them to the tool if I know their location? And uh, to me, that's one of, I, I was hesitant to use this tool at first because it didn't use any of the geo coordinates that were in a Twitter person's profile or anything. It just simply did it on the text. So I think it's more of a, a desperate situation where if, you, if you've exhausted your methods of getting a geotag, you go to this tool and they compare it with the world data set. So moving on to a visual map. So this is the location of mental health services provided by SAMHSA. So I talked about SAMHSA earlier on, and SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And what they do is they do frequent surveys to determine where the current health centers are uh, and where the depressed users are. And they and this is these are actual locations of mental health services that are provided by SAMHSA. Um, uh, so they do quite frequent surveys, and if there's a new location, it will, it will show up on SAMHSA. So just visually looking at this, you can see a lot of users are in um, the Northeast, and then the Midwest, and then kind of sparse, and then you go down to the Los Angeles and California area. And I'll let you guys, I'll bring this map up in a little bit again. Um, but here are the location of our annotated and um, depressed users. So these are users that we manually annotated in our training data set, and this is what the map looks like. So as you can see, um, we have users all over the globe, and uh, we limited our tweet set and our user set to only English users to uh, simplify the classification and uh, uh, framework to, for, to identify depressed users, because it's easier to do this process if they're in English. So the red users are PGO, so this is kind of opposite of the color screen. So this is red because caution, we're not 100% sure about their location. This is a third party tool. The green ones are geo coordinates, so we can for sure say that this was their location. And the teal color is uh, the place mentioned. So if you mention Wright State University in your profile, we'll capture your geo coordinates that way. And then here's the data in the US. So just kind of focusing in on the US. So as you see the SAMHSA data table and the user data table are quite frequent. Or, or visually they seem to match. So here's the mental health services and then here's the US. And then we'll go into... So, so I mean, you do have good opportunity. I'll, t I'll, I'll show you the opportunity uh, in particular. So look at Mizura. Mm -hmm. Obviously, look at here. And look at Samsha, mm -hmm. and uh, you. Uh, it will be very interesting. For example, Missouri is ranked a 50th out mm -hmm. of 50 states in U.S. on healthcare, and among the uh, problems that they have that are you know multiple. I mean, all the three major that I mentioned yeah. are the problems. If you focused on, uh, so you just look at that 50, and um, several of them. There's about 10 of them actually talk about uh, mental health issues. I at them because this is you know, public data based thing, and see if that you can relate it here in terms of higher deviation. And that would be a fantastic thing to do. Even if you have eight out of 10, you have a great study. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's definitely the type of analysis that we want to do. Okay. Um, uh, because th that's what's really useful for policy design. Exactly. Right? exactly. So me telling you Ohio needs more yeah. More thing doesn't really give you enough insight as to say where, why, yeah. and what need what needs are actually needed in Ohio. So sure, I can say we need more outpatient centers, mm -hmm. but what type of outpatient centers do we need? So here's our kind of approach to uh, test our location inferencing work. So what we want to do is we want to first determine where, based on our t our uh, training and testing data, where should these mental health services for our users. So we're going to pretend like the rest of the world doesn't exist right now and we're going to look at our data and say, based on my data set, where, where do my users need a mental health service? So we're taking kind of like a blind approach first and looking at, based on my users, 
here is where the optimal uh, mental health service should be located. And I choose a clustering approach because we want to group similar items together. So similar users or users that are in a close vicinity with each other. And particularly, I focused on dbSCAN. And dbSCAN is a clustering algorithm and it's an unsupervised clustering, al clustering algorithm that does it based on density. So how dense is an area and how dense is a cluster. And the good thing is with dbSCAN, I don't have to determine um, the number of clusters I should have. And it's typical with clustering algorithms that we run into the problem, oh, how many clusters should I have? It's a lot of testing and training and kind of human picking a number to see the clustering algorithm. But with dbSCAN, it learns from itself. Um, and uh, it, does a, it, it, it does this density-based clustering holistically on itself. So it, it determines how many centers and what size the center should be, and then reorders them as needed. Um, and then once we have each centroid, so once I've clustered my users, I figure, it out where, I figure out where the center of the users is. So if I take all of the users in Dayton and I figure out the center of my Dayton users is the right state student union, I would say that I need a mental health service near the student union. So this type of approach, again, it's, it's kind of like a blind approach based on my users. This is where I need the centers. So what I do is once I have my, my uh, predicted centers or my centroids, I compare this to the nearest mental health facility reported by SAMHSA. So this gives us a distance that this is what I'm predicting and this is where the actual mental health facility is, now, how far. For each pin on that, uh, uh, in, on your map, is mm -hmm. a single user or multi, is a set of users? This is a single user. And then I'll move on to the clusters in a little bit. But that number of set, so only, only thing I would say here is that uh, the, the method sounds good, interesting, useful, but that data size, size is too small. Correct, and, uh, and a lot of this, as I mentioned, was because the computational and will, yeah. limitations. And it will yeah. improve, I guess, uh, as yeah. we with that idea. Definitely. So but I would, I would say that uh, we need to get uh, one order of magnitude at least higher mm -hmm. so uh, how uh, this to, than what you see now, and then we can be much more confident. Mm -hmm. how, how does this take into account population density? So right, right now, like I said, it's a blind approach. So I'm just doing this based on where my users so are. So one person in Missouri is as important as one person in New York. Correct. Right yeah. now. Yeah, Correct. right, right, right mm -hmm. now with this blind approach. So without considering socioeconomic regions or, like you said, state population, population or anything yeah. like that, we're just fo just doing, I have 10 users here and they need a service here. These are reported users who are depressed and now you're going to see whether there are mental health facilities nearby. Yeah. Right? So maybe I just add one more thing here. Basically, we have yeah. to consider the population, specifically Twitter population, to do some somehow the normalization. Mm -hmm. Because imagine that we are yeah. claiming that okay, number of depressed people in California is not comparable with number of people in South Dakota. Right. Okay. So the way that we want to approach is approach it for now is, okay, so how many basically users we already know using Twitter around all United States? Then somehow normalize, then do the analysis. So for... So, so I, I recognize it's a proof of concept, but I just, again, want to make sure I'm yeah. clear on what, what, what you've done and what you haven't done. That's okay. Right now, if I had a thousand people who all mm -hmm. happen to be at Rice University, mm -hmm. The centroid was the student union, and there was something at the student union mm -hmm. that would be considered to basically be fine, mm -hmm. even though there's ten thousand of them. There's no there's no capacity base no. just because it's there. Mm -hmm. Not quite because of DB scan, so it does density base, so it optimizes how many users should be in a cluster. So for the ten thousand example, DB scan would split them as two different centroids. Um, that are near each other because it's kind of like a supply and demand. So if I lot of, have a lot of demand so in one area, even if you have different a, a bunch of clusters in the same area, each mm -hmm. one can only be associated with a single mm -hmm. mental health facility. Perfect. Yes, awesome. Yeah, love it. Uh, and, and like I mentioned, so this is just some preliminary analysis that I've done on my part. But as a part of the depression, just speaking for the team as a whole, we plan to test out different clustering algorithms uh, that are compatible or comparable to dbSCAN to determine which one is the best and see if there's another metric that, we, that we're possibly not uh, looking at right now. But this is just some of, the, some of the approach that I took on myself to look at and see what our results look like. Okay. So um, it's a big data set, so a lot of it is collecting, fine-tuning, 
making sure everything is checked, all the data types are the same and stuff like that. So for initial results, we're focusing on smaller data and looking at it uh, for a holistic approach. So just kind of, like you said, it's a proof of concept to see what's going on. So this next slide um, is uh, a basic box plot to determine uh, the average, dis or sorry, to see the distance that my centroid is from my mental health service that pro that's provided by SAMHSA. And then this one is for users. So here's my user and here's the nearest mental health facility to them. <coughs> so right now you can see the user one is pretty, it's pretty off. These are preliminary results. So we can't really claim anything off of the user blocks box plot yet uh, because as you see one of them is 7,000 miles away so like <laughs> it, the user portion we still need to do some fine-tuning on but if you look at the centroid approach uh, it, it does quite well so by quite well I mean we can see pretty reasonable results if you see that I think the median uh, is around 15 um, I don't think I have that number or, 20, there, but or 30 miles or yeah <laughs> something like that so 30 miles and a lot of the data fits Pretty much in the nice, the first three quarters, pretty much in like a nice uh, around 50 mile. So your cluster system. center and the actual facility is mm -hmm. within 30 miles? Yeah, of each other. And then we have the same deviation. And then we have some outliers. So on the next map, I'll show um, the outliers uh, more compared to SAMHSA right now. And so this is, this is pretty interesting because we can see that we have some users. So the outliers is probably what we would want to look at to identify where to put these use, uh, the mental health facilities that we're proposing to policy designers. Uh, but for the rest of it, it's kind of uh, just... We need to yeah. argue on the adequate amount of data set or, mm -hmm. you know, things before Correct. we could. No, but users, how did it come to 1,000 miles? 7,000, yeah. How, how yeah. I mean, 7,000 miles away. There are so many mental health facilities, right? How, how can you have that kind so of... So we had users in, like, Hawaii and stuff like that. And I think you just need wow. to take out Hawaii and Alaska <laughs> yeah. before before you do right. that. Okay. Yeah, so, I, <laughs> so, I like, so to me, this was really interesting, and I tried to look into this. No, but this is I predominantly some, Hawaii, then, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, kind of yeah. And, and to me, I was surprised how it didn't classify that as an outlier as well. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of like work that needs to be done to look into why the user section of this is. So bad. I bet. Like, uh, I bet the number of uh, yeah. the mm -hmm. portion yeah. of uh, prevalence of uh, depression in Alaska is pretty high. In that no, but uh, Alaska should have at least one health center, right? Yeah, I mean, then I, I, thousand? I mean, seven. Th <laughs> I would. I'm taking this with a grain of salt. I know this. Okay. Like, I ideally, like, this is so bad it doesn't even like. Yeah. Worth to be on it's the slide right now. But to me, it, it was something that's like future. We're gonna improve this. Right now, this chart is just like. This is what we got on our small data set. Yeah. So certainly, uh, we, we're concerned about people who don't have access to, mm -hmm. to mental health facilities. Yeah. But there is another kind of error, mm -hmm. and that is oversupply. Oh. Okay. Can you s speak to the oversupply problem at all with the analyses? No, I think there's a better than that. So because I, that that's I, for controlling so cost, right? Sense. So right now we're we're not. Our methodology isn't for oversampling right now. Well, oversupply. Or oversupply, sorry. Oversupply. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah you know, uh, whether you have, you have more health care yeah. facilities than you really need given the frequency mm -hmm. that, that you're observing. Correct. Yeah, so we don't, we don't really have, our approach doesn't speak to that yet. Okay. But that would be um, another thing that we would like to look at because if there are certain areas that have quite a few mental health services, why not? use those resources elsewhere. So so this is the, actually the problem that I just worked on with uh, Patik Parikh um, okay. yeah. in, in our you know hospital emergency room location. Yeah. So it's, it's the same problem, but we yeah. looked at both kinds of errors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this one does not do um, where situations where we have a lot of mental health facilities, but not a lot of patients to use right. them. So that, that is definitely a very key thing that we should include in our, in our next part of the study is looking at the um, oversupply problem. So here are the centroids. So this is where all of the mental health facilities that my algorithm recommended. So uh, visually, it looks like SAMHSA's, but we'll see. So here are the actual centroid, uh, the mental health facilities. The green ones are reported by SAMHSA, and you can compare them to the red ones on this map over here. So 
as you can see, uh, the density is pretty high of the green in this area, and same with my map, if I go back. Now, on this map, I kind of put our centroid, our outlier centroids on here. So the teal, so these blue ones right here, are the centroids that were outliers in my box plot. So this is showing that here, I don't, like visually, we can't really see the distance between the closest mental health facility, uh, but it's showing that this is where the need is. We, I have users here, but there is no SAMHSA data mm -hmm. there. So the teal users are where we would want to hint policy designers to. So if you're trying to figure out where to allocate resources, the first thing you want to do is look at these areas because there were outliers in our data set. Um, so just kind of going over a summary of the approach. So the first, first thing we do is figure out if users are depressed. Second, we determine their location. And then third, we can use this to assist policy designers that are trying to figure out where to allocate mental health resources. Um, so overall, this is a proof of concept for um, our study. And I think that is like Dr. Sheth keeps mentioning that we have a bigger data set. We're not. We're just not using it right now. So as um, like we're not using it in this work right now. But when we will be using it is what I should say. So we have um, a lot of data, but our computation capabilities are pretty restrictive right now for various reasons. But what we want to do is expand the. <laughs> no, no, this is, this is more on, this is, this is more on technical capabilities on my end, oh. but yeah, we're working to learn more ways to make all of the processing faster and how can we include users. So the next step is using Hadoop and Spark to do a lot of the feature engineering that we're working on because it is really expensive to calculate these features like average tweet average favorite count, um, and it's slow to do on individual servers, and we want to use something like Spark that can streamline this and make it faster, but there's a huge learning curve involved in that, so um, this semester is focused on uh, using the features engineering on a more sophisticated cloud platform rather than the one that I'm using currently. So um, it's been an interesting project so far. And um, here I'll talk about what did I learn. So um, <laughs> back of your data is a pretty big issue that I have. So um, over the summer, I was at an internship. And when I came back, um, I realized that our, our data set, had our nodes in our cluster had been affected by like a data, data mm -hmm. corruption uh, thing. So um, unfortunately, I couldn't even access the backup that we had. And so we need to look at backing up your data in various locations. Um, so memory errors and heap errors do occur. So I invited Mr. Andresik to my talk, but he was out of town, so he couldn't make it. So freshman year, I was sitting in class, and you know he kept saying, memory errors are going to happen, computation is limited. And I was like, no, no, no. Like I, I don't see that as a challenge. But when I went to go run my classifier, do my analysis, I got quite a few memory and heap errors. So, this really tells me that nothing is as infinite as it seems, and computational limits do exist today. So to me, this was a very big eye opener, because freshman year, I assumed everything works as soon as I hit the play button in NetBeans, but it's not like that. So uh, this is pretty cool. And I learned a few things about using servers and distributed computing. Um, I got to use threading. So I had learned about this in my operating systems class, but I actually got to use it for the first time on this project. And it was, it was pretty exciting to see how much time my code could take and how much time it does take when I use threading um, and using threading the right way. Because once I like learned how to use it, I was really obsessed with it and tried to use it for a lot of my tasks. And then I realized context switching and all of this stuff is not really effective in the long run. Um, additionally, I talked about classification. So this was the first time we used numeric features and text features um, in a classifier. Previously, I just used text features. So it was very interesting, all the challenges that you face when you have different data types that you're trying to use in a classifier. Um, and this is going to get even more challenging because next semester we have images and how do we incorporate them into a classifier. So um, the learning curve of this project uh, doesn't really steady down. It keeps increasing. So every time you're at a point, you're like, all right, I reached a milestone. But it's like, all right, cool, congratulations. Now let's move on to the next step. So uh, it's, I really like working on this project. A lot of real world challenges. Um, and uh, I've had a lot of good learning opportunities. So all of the graphs that you see, I never graphed in 
or, or make graph plots like on a computer, basically. I know it, it doesn't seem too hard, but it's, it's, it was pretty cool for me when I was able to analyze my results and visually see them rather than just a list of numbers. So um, overall, it was a pretty exciting project, and I'd like to wrap up with some acknowledgments. So first of all, thank you to my mentors, Amir and Saeed. So these two guys have, uh, these past week, they've been with me filing uh, my honors pre uh, presentation, but overall, they've been really good mentors in the whole research process. So telling me to read research papers, forcing me to read <laughs> research papers, telling me to think outside of the box. And you know, a lot of times I get excited about one algorithm and they're like, no, 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 that's not. Like you gotta look at the broader scope. So uh, they've been very good help uh, mentors and Amir helps me do a lot of other things like writing papers and uh, really how, how do you present what you're working on? So a lot of the times I realize that I get too caught up in the technical issues, but when it comes to presenting it, I'm just like, ah, whatever, no one cares, because I'm too excited about the technical. So he's kind of like a reality check, like this is, this is what matters to you. You have to present and showcase what you've been working on. And of course, to my committee members, Dr. Shah, an amazing advisor. Um, uh, he is always posting new articles to read in the depression community, and that, that really helps you keep uh, true to what the mission of the project is. Not just focus on learning of uh, new ways to do it, but rather how are you going to impact this. And since this is a funded project, it's, it's a pretty significant portion of um, the project here is are we actually doing meaningful, meaningful research. Um, and then Dr. Prasad, who I can always go to and then say, hey, does this approach make sense or not? And then Dr. Doom, uh, thank you so much for your guidance along my four years here and uh, I really appreciate you being on my honors committee uh, committee, and uh, thank you so much. And of course Noesa, so a lot of the people today because of finals week, but this is a really fun and amazing group to work with. Um, I have a pretty nice coffee crew with me and uh, we enjoy making lattes and uh, they're pretty tasty too. So um, a lot of my classmates, so when I take classes with Dr. Shath, I see, and Dr. Prasad, I see a lot of my novices, uh, people that I work with as classmates too. So it's interesting to work on research problems together and then um, for us to learn together and then apply those um, aspects into our research. So it's a very nice cycle. And then of course I have numerous mentors um, in, at Noesis too. So uh, Mike, Alan, Jeremy, so the software engineers are really helpful when I have um, the computational questions. They are very insightful and can tell me what packages to go to or where libraries or hey you shouldn't be using that, use this instead. And of course Hussein, um, he's he is Amir's counterpart. <laughs> He's a, <laughs> he is pretty good at another reality check. So when Amir's not around, Hussein is my go-to person. Um, he's pretty good with helping me with writing, helping me with presentations. So he was here watching my drawing run yesterday, and thank you so much. So um, a lot of acknowledgments to make here, and then along with the references that I've used for this presentation. So if there are any questions, I will take them at this time. Questions? Uh. <laughs> 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 I'm the young, youngest member here. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I have one. Yeah. So given the way you collected the data and the way that you did your analysis, can you say anything at all about the base rate of depression in, in the population? Mm -hmm. So I think um, the data collection is really challenging mm. because we, like, even the semi-supervised approach to identify depressed users, there's a lot of non-depressed users out there. So I will say that there are a lot of depressed users out there, and the percentage I can't really give you, but they're very hard to mine for, Yeah, is, is what I, so I, I would say from what we get, we're happy with, we can identify 10 to 15% of our results as depressed or not, because this is such a challenging data set okay. to mine and to analyze. So. I mean, ideally, we would like to expand this and get more users, but that comes with computational cost. Yeah, well, I, so I, I, I looked this up, and it says that 23% of women in their 40s and 50s take antidepressants. So there's a, there's a standard that you could use, at least for comparison's sake, right. yeah. which is the amount of, yeah. of prescription mm -hmm. uh, drug, uh, drugs. Yeah, and that's true. 
and that's a lot of the future work for the Depression pro uh, Project is using the socioeconomic data around a region and using prescription facts and incorporating a lot of other features like images to figure out which users are females and their age. So images can help us with this. If we can figure out from a profile image if it's a female profile that we're looking at and versus how old they are, it can let us to these type of challenging questions that we do want to answer that require a much more holistic approach, not just looking at our data, but looking at other factors that appear outside of the work. And um, a lot of the prescription things that you're mentioning we're working on with ADR and stuff like that. So uh, ideally, there's a lot of different things we can do and, and we hope to do, actually, is because like you said, this is a very nice proof of concept, but like, what's next, you know? Like, how can I tell that, am I targeting the right audience or am I getting the right patients to, um, Using this method. There are a lot of other things going on, like adverse drug reaction, mm -hmm. those are the things that are going on the project here. Mm -hmm. So I've already, I've already had a lot of questions. This is more of just a comment. Um, this is exactly what I want and expected to see uh, as an honors project presentation from one of our best undergraduate students. And, and honestly, this is a better presentation of the scope and contribution of your project than many MS thesis defenses that I've seen. Don't say the same. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic job. Yeah. Um, see why I call this. You can press that guy. Why, see why I um, have uh, kind of advocated this little powerhouse to be the PhD student here, right? So. Um, <laughs> where, wherever she goes, she will make massive contributions. Yeah. You know, the important thing is to make. In the right she, she in the right group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, thank you. And, and a lot of the credit that you're giving me here is not only is not is not due to me, it's due to the amazing people that I work with. So yeah, a lot of oh, yeah, no no no. <laughs> like the learning the learning curve here has been very challenging and I've learned so much compared to my first internship. So they did an NLP too, right? But I didn't learn as much as I learned here in a very short amount of time. And what's interesting is that like these projects, I can use these approaches in different data sets. And in different, so I, my internship, everything that I did here I was able to use. And even the stuff that I learned in IR that I didn't have time to use yet, I was able to apply and successfully do it at my internship. So just, I think being around <coughs> all of these exciting projects and being in the Dayton region itself has a lot of power, and uh, it really a lot of the things that I've learned are because of Wright State. And we have amazing faculty members, amazing teachers, and you know I, I probably wouldn't get that anywhere else. But yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think that's that then. Thank you. Fantastic. Let's wrap up.